2017 Transportation Spotlight Webinar. Today's presentation is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be substituted for legal advice. Should you have any legal questions, please direct them to your legal counsel. Before we begin, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. If you encounter any audio or visual issues, please refresh the browser window by clicking F5 on your keyboard. Or you can click on the Help widget in the taskbar at the bottom of the screen. You can expand the size of the slide area by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide or by clicking on the top right of the slide. We will take questions at the conclusion of the webinar. To type your question, click the Q&A widget in the taskbar at the bottom of your screen. If we are unable to answer your question during the time allotted, we will respond to you via email later. We value your feedback, so please take our short survey at the end of this presentation. Your input helps us to ensure that future webinar topics will be beneficial to your business. Mm -hmm. A link to the 2017 Transportation Spotlight Report will be emailed to you tomorrow. This report will cover the information presented during today's webinar. Finally, during this webinar, please tweet using hashtag HighRightWebinar. Following our webinar, the most engaged Twitter participant will receive an exclusive thank you package from Highlight. Today's host for the event will be Stephen Spencer. Stephen has more than 25 years of experience in business development, operations, sales, and product innovation. He joined Highlight in January of 1999 where he led the creation of the account management program for the transportation division and was responsible for building deeper customer relationships and driving revenue growth. Currently, Mr. Spencer is accountable for all transportation lines of business in his role as managing director. He also is active with the American Trucking Association and serves on the Labor and Regulatory Committee. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Stephen. All right. Thanks, Kent. I want to say thanks to everyone just quickly that uh, participated in the survey, and certainly all of those that are joining us today, thank you as well. Throughout our time today, we're going to review the survey results, identify trends, and gain insights into practices and other, that other comparable companies are using. To give you a break and not have to listen to me the entire time, we will have some polling questions throughout that we would love to have you participate in. We will identify those as we go along. So before we begin the meat of the report, let me give you an idea of who was responding to our report. Higher Rights 2017 Transportation Spotlight is a subset of the 10th Annual Higher Right Employment Screening Benchmark Survey. This year, over 3,600 U.S.-based respondents responded, and 17% indicated their primary industry was transportation. 84% of those respondents were from trucking organizations, and the rest were from other modes of transportation. 72% of the respondents were from companies with fewer than 500 employees. The majority of respondents worked in human resources departments, and 59% were executives, owners, directors, managers, or supervisors. Please keep in mind that as we go through the results of this year's survey, some statistics may not add up to 100% since multiple responses were allowed on some questions. With the basics of the report creation out of the way, let's talk about the 2017 business and hiring outlook. 72% of respondents expect to increase their workforce this year compared to 85% in 2016. If you look at the survey trends for the past three consecutive years, the aggressive growth expectation have been slowly declining. 
companies expect no change is at the highest level in the last four years. According to Bob Costello, chief economist of ATA, he expects the economy will grow at a faster pace this year compared to 2016. GDP should increase 2.6% in 2017 versus the 1.6% growth in 2016. In addition to better economic growth this year, the inventory overhang throughout the supply chain is subsiding. The improvement will provide a boost to truck volumes, to freight volumes. On the trucking side, truckload volumes were essentially flat in 2016. Based on economic activity, truck, truck loads should increase up to 2% this year. For LTL fleets, sluggish factory output will continue to be a drag, but this group can still increase volumes closer to 1% versus a near 1% contraction in 2016. Additionally, as freight volumes improve, capacity should get marginally tighter, helping the bottom line. The transportation industry is at a cusp of a great change. As technology such as self-driving trucks, autonomous platooning, drones, the so-called Uberization of freight, as well as the Internet of Things and big data will drastically change the way we all do business. Morgan Stanley conservatively estimates that the freight industry could save $168 billion annually by harnessing autonomous technology, $70 billion just from reduced staff alone. Safety technology is being explored or considered by 38% of the respondents. Collision avoidance, stability control, and lane departure warning systems actively alert drivers of potentially unsafe condition and in some cases even take action on their own. 35% of respondents are looking at telematics. Onboard communication devices record vehicle engine data, speed, location, or other information during critical events, such as hard braking or excessive G-forces. Electronic logging device technology automatically records a driver's time and other hours of service data. ELDs must have the capability of either telematic data transfer or local transfer. All carriers and drivers subject to the ELD rules must use either an ELD or an automatic onboard recording device by December 18, 2017. AOBRDs may be used until December 16, 2019. And here we have our first polling question. So if you would select the answer that most is what you are seeing here. Which one of these is your biggest concern related to self-driving trucks? And we'll wait for a moment here for our marketing gurus to push out our results. There we go. Looks like, uh, by far, the safety consequences of a safety failure at 52.2%. Legal liability for owners at 20%, which may tie into that system failure as well. And inability to drive as well as humans. Well, good. Thank you for taking the time. I think that's good insight for everyone. The driver shortage is a significant challenge and one that continues to be a critical concern for carriers of all sizes. In this section, we'll review some of the strategies and tactic tactics used to confront this challenge. According to a Forbes report, the average tenure of U.S. employees, regardless of age or job type, is a mere 4.6 years. Millennials leave after two years. 76% of full-time workers are either actively looking for a job or open to a new opportunity. The top two reasons cited for why drivers are leaving companies have remained consistent for the past four years, to make more money and to spend more time at home. However, better benefits, formerly third most cited reason, moved into fifth position this year, being replaced by retirement. With 26.2% of drivers aged 55 plus, retirement continues to be a major contributing factor for the bulk of future driver demand. Survey results showed an 11% increase in retirement from 2014 and a 4% increase in 
risk increase over last year. As the driver population ages, the industry is losing individuals because they can no longer re recertify after DOT, DOT physical due to health. 21% of respondents cited health issues as a reason for losing drivers. More than a quarter, or 29% of respondents, cited that the job was not what the employee expected. Driver recruits come with a set of preconceived expectations and experience that will be shaped by how the company describes the job and associated requirements. The growing shortage of drivers is triggering companies to implement new tactics to bolster driver recruitment and to attract a more diverse audience. Referrals remain the number one recruiting methodology. However, a noticeable shift is occurring away from traditional tactics such as online job boards, down 10% from last year, and print media trade publications, which is down 6% from last year. The use of social networking as a recruitment tool increased 13% across the board. 63% of organizations with 500 or more employees engaged in social media. Using social media and SEO to drive traffic to company websites will greatly improve chances of finding passive candidates. Likely trends we'll continue to see in 2017 and beyond are the continued use of multi-channel social platforms including the increased use of Snapchat, Instagram, and many companies may add gamification to entice candidates. Recruiters will need to actively engage with the marketing departments to effectively brand and craft messages to design, define their company's unique value proposition. Sharing compelling content is imperative to attract candidates. This would be things like photos, videos, award events, and your company's charity work. Use, use social media and strengthen relationships with people already on your team, not just the, to recruit new ones. Have coworkers follow your page, post photos, and engage in the conversation. People get tired of being sold on something. If you really want to generate driver leads, then create compelling content. Publish stories, post photos and videos that gives prospects an inside look at your company culture. Assign a person or two and schedule who's going to post what and when. That's what it takes to stay fresh and engaged with people. Make sure your social media presence is giving a great first impression. If you aren't impressed with your social media sites, how do you expect the prospects to be interested? Put your best foot forward. Industry average states that out of 100 newly hired drivers, 33 will leave the 90 days after being hired, with an additional 22 leaving by the 180-day mark. The importance of getting new hires engaged in positive training and feedback loop is critical within the first six months of employment. And that comes from a fleet owner article referenced in the full uh, spotlight report. Longer orientation and training periods are used by more than a third at 35% of the survey respondents. Proper onboarding can shorten a driver's learning curve, increase productivity, reduce errors, and facilitate overall job satisfaction and retention. Ask new drivers when hired about their expectations. Don't allow misconceptions to get out of hand. Identify them immediately and get everyone on the same page. Larger organizations with 500 plus employees are more apt to appoint driver liaisons or mentors than smaller organizations, 51% versus the 31%. And to conduct initial and ongoing surveys, this was a difference of 40% versus the 13%. And here we are at the second polling question. How often does your company conduct employee surveys? All right, it looks like annually is the, the winner here at 
uh, looks like ongoing continuous feedback uh, when employee leaves are pretty close, 13.9 and 14.5. As in previous years, we asked the top monetary and non-monetary tactics being used to retain drivers. Increasing pay was the top tactic employed by 50% of the survey's respondents, followed by upgrading equipment at 46% and performance-based bonuses at 41%. According to a report by Glassdoor.com, truck drivers' median base pay grew 7.8% this past year, from October 2015 to October 2016. This was the largest jump among 60 common professions analyzed with the national unemployment rate at 4.7% through February 2017, a level many economists consider close to full employment, and will make it harder for companies with lower pay rates to find and keep experienced drivers. Barring an economic surge, many companies will likely use more targeted pay hikes and look for other ways to boost compensation. Larger size organizations with 500 or more employees used recognition and reward programs more so than smaller organizations. That's the 50% versus 33%. One third of the respondents cited improving benefits as a key retention tactic, providing employee benefits that drivers can brag about to their peers as a powerful recruiting tool. As we discussed previously, spending more time at home is a key factor for driver retention. As you can see from the chart, companies are employing various tactics to address this need through the use of flexible work arrangements, 36%, dedicated operations at 29%, load swapping opportunities, 12%, and the ability to earn bankable home days at 8%. Personal development at 20% and leadership training at 18% are, implied more, uh, are applied more by organizations with 500 employees or more. Training programs have moved beyond the basic classroom style instruction to include audio-based educational materials that drivers can listen to while they're on the road. Gallup's 2014 workplace research study shows that 13% of the employees are highly engaged and 26% are actively disengaged. Tactics being utilized to engage drivers are driver appreciation events and social sharing communities. While all size organizations use driver appreciation events, it is being used by 70% of the survey respondents for medium and large size organizations. We consider that 100 or more employees. While, other seven, while only 7% of respondents are actively using social sharing communities for their drivers, this may be something you might want to consider starting. Life on the road is difficult and lonely. Social sharing communities serve many useful purposes. It's a way for your drivers to stay up to date with company info. It's a source to ask other drivers for advice and a resource for wellness tips, just to name a few. In this section, we'll look at the importance of screening and the types of background checks conducted. The top, the top two checks required by FMCSA are motor vehicle records. Sorry, my slide didn't advance there. Uh, the top two checks required by FMCA are motor vehicle records conducted by 94% of the respondents and previous employment and drug and alcohol verification at 87%. SIDLIS, PSP, criminal record, and identity checks have been shown in previous surveys as a background screening best practice employed over and above the regulatory minimum checks. SIDLIS is used by 85% of the respondents. HireRight recently offered a new product called SIDLIS Plus Complete. With one single order, HireRight will automatically provide MVR and PSP program reports. If you're interested in that, you can request that at the end of the survey. The PSP report is used by 75% of survey participants. The PSP report allows carriers to obtain five years of crash data and three years of roadside inspection data to prospective drivers from FMCSA's MICNIS database. To know this information upfront before hiring a driver is extremely valuable 
and you may want to consider adding this to the standard list of pre-employment checks. We've seen the use of criminal records remain fairly consistent from year to year and remains an important check in the transportation industry. This even after the changes with the EEOC guidance. Little has occurred as far as changing report, the use of reported criminal and other public searches. As I mentioned in the previous slide, conducting criminal background checks are an industry best practice. Employers who screen candidates for a history of criminal activity, violence, and fraud may be afforded certain protections and accusations of negligent hiring or retention. National criminal database searches are the most popular of the criminal searches at 61%. Now please keep in mind the national criminal database searches are a tip and lead private database search and are not intended to be comprehensive. These tips and leads should then be verified at the primary source. Over half of the respondents who conducted state, court, and county court checks. The EEOC does not prohibit the use of criminal checks. They simply want to help ensure the information is not used in a discriminatory manner. Individualized assessments of criminal records should be done, which include the nature of the crime, the time elapsed since the criminal conduct occurred, and the nature of the specific job. The employer should give the applicant the opportunity to explain why he or she does not, should not be excluded from consideration. Ban the box laws limit an employer when they may permissibly ask about an individual's criminal history. Typically, the law prohibits any covered employers from asking about criminal history until the first interview or conditional offer. However, each state and local law is nuanced as to what can be asked and when it can be asked. Employers are encouraged to speak with their experienced legal counsel for further guidance. Ban the box and fair chance laws will continue to expand across the U.S. and second chance programs increasing in importance for employers. Okay, in the next section we're going to talk about drug and health screening practices. Almost half of the respondents at 45% conduct drug testing on their non-regulated employee base. While testing is not mandatory for employees in non-DOT positions, testing the entire workforce maintains uniformity and helps in maintaining a drug-free workplace. When asked what additional drug alcohol tests are used beyond the DOT required specimens, more than half at 51% of the respondents utilize blood as a specimen for alcohol test, and another 43% use saliva. The use of hair testing increased eight percentage points over last year's survey. As many of you already know, the DOT approved the use of electronic chain of custody forms on the final rule effective April 13, 2015. It's taken a while to be able to offer this because of our lab partners, which were required to submit a detailed plan and proposed scope of work, SOP, for electronic CCF to the NLCP. Higher Right is targeting ECOC for transportation customers this summer. As can be seen from the Higher Right MRO verified positive rate chart, alternative specimens are tracking significantly higher than the urine positive rate. According to a National Institute of Drug Abuse survey on drug use, a one-point increase in MRO verified positive rate confers a cost avoidance of $14,000 per 100 tests. While urine positivity rates have decreased over time, the artificially low rates may be the result of cheating, especially in unmonitored collection situations. Urine samples can be easily manipulated through adulteration, dilution, or substitution. Employers should evaluate the various testing specimens to determine which specimen test or type best meets the needs of its organization. Consider the cost and the length of the det detection window. <clears throat> Many trucking companies are using urinalysis to meet federal requirements while also paying the additional cost to conduct hair testing. A proposed rule that would allow trucking companies to conduct government-certified pre-employment drug testing 
using hair samples likely will not be publicly released until the end of this year or early 2018, and that's according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. And now for one of my favorite parts of this webinar. Each year we do ask uh, the participants in this survey some of the most creative reasons that they've heard for failing drug tests. So this year, the first one we have is that marijuana butter was used in the brownie mix. Well, I would suspect there was probably more than marijuana butter in that mix. I didn't know that weed was a drug. Accidentally took the pet's medication. I hate when that happens. Driving by a field and law enforcement officials burning a large batch of marijuana. And probably what we don't know is that they pulled over and sat there for a while. I didn't know it was non-human urine. I'm wondering if maybe that was the pet from uh, the bullet point three there. Cash back from a liquor store that must have been used to snort cocaine. My parents do drugs, inherited positive results from them. And finally, I'm not stupid, I don't do drugs at work, only rec recreationally every night. And I think that one speaks for itself. When asked who reviews your FMCSA long form exams to assure drivers meet the minimum medical requirements, 46% have their internal safety team review results. 28% depend on their certified medical examiner and 19% use an outside party. Many companies use HireRight to review their driver's medical exams that were conducted by a certified medical examiner. Our medical teams review results to help validate completeness and facilitate compliance. And even with the introduction of the National Registry of Certified Medical Examiners and all the associated training requirements to become a registered examiner, Higher right is finding significant errors that may have been overlooked if not reviewed by a medical professional. Higher right brokered more than 72,000 FMCSA exams in 2016. Of those exams reviewed by Higher right, 24% had compliance issues. 15% of the exam forms were not completed properly. 9% of the exams were flawed from a compliance perspective despite the exam being completed by a certified medical examiner. And 2.2% of the exams reviewed by the higher right compliance team were, were qualified by a certified medical examiner, but upon our review, the driver either did not meet the standards or could not provide documentation supporting the examiner, the examiner's certification. As most of you on this call know, it's tough for drivers to live a healthy lifestyle while driving long haul. A study released last year by the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health found long haul truckers were twice as likely to be obese compared to the adult working population and more likely to smoke tobacco and suffer from other risk factors from chronic disease. The top wellness benefit offered is free immunization of flu shots at 23%. Approximately one-fifth of the respondents offer wellness education, smoking cessation, weight loss contests, and preventative health screenings. Carriers are concerned about their current drivers who are not able to recertify after their DOT physicals due to health issues. Incentives and motivational programs are being offered along with social media forums where the company and drivers can share success stories and tips. 13% of respondents are actively partnering with a sleep study screening and treatment vendor. While FMCSA regulations do not specifically address sleep apnea, they do prescribe that a person with a medical history or clinical diagnosis of any condition likely to interfere with their ability to drive safely cannot be medically qualified to operate a commercial motor vehicle in interstate commerce. However, once successfully treated, a driver may regain their medically qualified to drive status. It's important to note that most cases of sleep apnea, those can be treated successfully. And so now we're to our third polling question. This one, please click any that apply. So not just one, but any that apply. Oh, 
All right. Um, wow, looks pretty pretty spread out, but it looks like cost at 45.1% is the top reason. Insufficient staff resources and failure to engage high-risk employees uh, are pretty close to the, the next spot. In this section, we're going to review screening challenges and planned improvements for the year. When asked what HR investments were planned for 2017, 68% of respondents plan on making investments to find qualified job candidates and to reduce turnover. Approximately one-third or 30% plan on improving the candidate experience from application through onboarding. When asked what activities are being done to ensure a good candidate experience, 61% reported they conduct follow-up communication, 40% have mobile-friendly applications and screening process, and 38% have candidate-friendly emails. According to Deloitte's Global Mobile Consumer Survey, mobile usage is on the rise, but the scale and frequency is actually quite interesting. The number of times Americans check their phones has grown to 8 billion times per day. 43% check their phones within the first five minutes of waking up, and 33% check their phones within five minutes before going to sleep. As our mobile phones become more and more ritualized in our daily behavior, their influence in recruiting and candidate engagement strengthens. 16% of survey respondents plan on adding mobile-friendly applications or screening process in 2017. And here's another check all that apply polling question. What additional activities are you doing to improve the candidate experience? Looks like 65.5% spell out next step in hiring process. And pretty close to second is seek current employee input or use videos. Uh, Career Builder reported that 56% of candidates who felt like they had a positive hiring process and experience said that they would seek employment with the company again in the future, and 37% would tell others to apply here. So that can make a big impact. So that, that really wraps up all of our information from our report. And I would like to tell you that uh, tomorrow you will receive an email with a link to download a copy of this report if you would like to do so. And we are going to open up here just shortly for some questions. So at this time, I'd like to open it up for any questions that you have. For those questions that we're unable to answer today, we will follow up uh, with you via email. So please take a minute to fill out the short survey. Your feedback is always appreciated once we wrap up here. So let's uh, have some questions. Okay, Stephen, I have a uh, question here from one of the attendees. Uh, the question is, is it legal to conduct MVR check, PSP check, and SIDLIS before a conditional offer is made? So I, I can answer that. The question, the answer is yes. That is legal to run those background checks prior to making a conditional job offer. Oh, and I would just add, of course, you know, that the, the, the caveat always is that they find the release form, right, that you have a permissible purpose, that you have some kind of release, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Okay, a number of people are asking if they can get copies of the slides, and we will be sending a uh, link to you tomorrow that uh, will allow you to get the 2017 Transportation Spotlight Report, which provides the information that was covered in the presentation today.
Okay, another question is, how can you find out if a potential employee is a legal citizen? So that was one section that we did not uh, actually address. We, we did ask it in the spotlight. We weren't sure uh, the interest, but that would be kind of the E-Verify, the I-9 process. Uh, that would be the, the, the product, and, and certainly maybe that person that asked Kent, we could, we could send them some information about that. Yeah, they should be able to indicate some additional information if they take the survey at the end of the, the webinar and, and highlight that. But we'll, we can certainly follow up with uh, anyone who's asked that type of question that needs some more information. But yeah, that would be the, the E-Verify process and your, your I-9 product. Right. Another question, uh, when is the centralized drug screen database going to be up and running? So the, um, the reference here is to the drug and alcohol clearinghouse that is targeted to be up and running in January of 2020, and then there will be a three-year period when the data will be collected to have enough information in the database to cover the three-year drug and alcohol violation history uh, verification that's required by the FMCSA regulation. So technically, you'll It'll be up and running. You'll be using it in January of 2020, and then at, um, in January of 2023, you should um, no longer have to do any manual verifications. You should be able to get your all of your verifications through that database for drug and alcohol. Stephen, are you reading any of these questions or? Well, I, yeah, I was just actually typing, Sharon. I'm having trouble getting the question, the Q&A box to resize, so I'm only seeing just a few words of the question. So that's why I'm struggling here a little bit. Of, All right. I can't get it to resize. Another question is paperless logs. Is this actually going to be postponed? Um, well, I don't think so. From what I've heard from ATA, it uh, looks like this is going to be going into effect December of 2017. But if there's a, my understanding is different than that, we'll follow up with you and let you know. And for those of you who are indicating you want more information, we'll certainly follow up in the next day or so with some. Um, some information about products or services that you're interest, interested in. Um, and there's a question about, so the window resize for me, that's good. Uh, you had a stat about 73% of 18 to 34 year olds found jobs on social networking. And I think, I can't quite see the rest of the question. It says, what is data? I'm not sure what else that says. Uh, I think, our data sources are listed when we send you the report. You'll be able to see all of our, our, our resources there. I think that's the question. Where did that data come from, I think, is the question. The question here in regard to independent contractors, if dealing with independent contractors, and ordering screenings on their behalf, whose responsibility is it to notify a candidate of negative results? So that would be the company that is doing the background screen. So if you're screening a independent contractor who's going to be leasing equipment to your company, you're required by FMCSA to have a driver qualification file on anyone who's operating if they're operating the equipment, of course. So you would be uh, required to respond to them with any negative results. 
So there's a question here about what information is on the SIDLESS report and do I need to run it for drivers. Um, SIDLESS is the acronym that stands for the Commercial Driver's License Information System, and it contains the current and previous CDL numbers. So that helps comply with the regulation that says you must run three years of motor vehicle reports regardless of state. So this is a way to kind of independently of the driver see where they've had a uh, commercial driver's license. Certainly, SIDLESS is not a regulated regulation requirement, only to help facilitate the requirement of three years of MDR. It was mentioned earlier in the presentation uh, about Uberization for freight. What do you mean by Uberization for freight? Can you answer that, Stephen? Yeah, so Uberization of freight is not unlike what Uber has done with uh, ride sharing. So it's basically like freight sharing. There are apps out there that would allow somebody who might have a truck or a box truck or whatever uh, to basically independently pick up and haul and carry loads. So uh, that, that's something we've seen a few different companies kind of dip their toes into. Uh, and we, we even see it with individuals just like an individual pickup truck. Um, so if that continues to gain ground, that would be an interesting impact a dynamic in the in the transportation space. Thank you. There are a number of questions here in regard to asking legal specific questions. So we're not attorneys, so and we're not authorized to give any legal advice. Um, there is a question here that says do I have to review medical long forms if a doctor has given clearance for up to two years. Doesn't the doctor review and give his professional opinion as to that? Well, the, the doctor or the medical uh, certified medical examiner would need to be qualified to conduct the physical. But we found at Higher Right, because our medical team does review physicals to make sure that they comply with the regulations, we found there really isn't a difference in the number of errors that have occurred prior to the uh, certified medical examiner program going into place versus after, like one year after it. So there are errors made, and that's why it is important for you to have somebody who's qualified to review the physical to make sure it complies with the regulatory requirements. And we kind of um, we kind of alluded to that during the presentation too. That it's not not just in the fact that maybe a doctor missed a condition, but sometimes what we're seeing is the doctor identified a condition that should have limited the card, the length. You know, they shouldn't have had a two-year card. It should have been a one-year card or even a six-month card. They identified the condition correctly, but then issued a card that should not have been issued. So it's it's just catching that. But they, they identified the condition. So should they really have a two year card, for example? So there's a question here uh, asking if we could go into more detail on the shared drug database. Um, I'm assuming that's another question about the drug and alcohol clearinghouse. So that clearinghouse is going to be uh, a requirement for prospective employers to use when it is in, uh, in service. And the data will be supplied by MROs and TPAs and employers in regard to uh, drug drug test result positive, drug alcohol results, refusals uh, to be tested, and the drug and alcohol violations, technically. So the database will be, is projected to be up and running in January of 2020. 
so that would be available for all the data to be start being provided to that database and employers prospective employers are required to use it but clearly there won't be all of the data that's needed to fulfill the three-year drug and alcohol verification that's required so you'll have to do manual verifications at the same time for companies or for individuals for companies that you don't get any information from the database in January of 2023 after three years of the database being in service, then you should be, you will be able to get all of the data needed to fulfill the three-year drug and alcohol verification that's required in 391.23. Long-winded answer, but hopefully that covers any further questions in regard to how that will work. Uh, I see a question. Uh, is there a way to get an MVR back quicker? Um, uh, Stu, we we do offer what's called an express MVR for our about 98 to 99 percent of the time. The express MVR, MVRs come back in less than a minute. There are different flavors of MVRs, both with us and other vendors, uh, that come back in what we call a standard batch time frame, which can be several hours to a full day. Um, so yes, there are MVR reports that come back, uh, like I said, for ours, 98 to 99% less than a minute if you're using the Express MVR. We're going through some of these questions. Some of these questions will require us to follow up later that um, we either don't have the answer or at this particular point in time. So we'll have to follow up with you on some of these. Yeah, there are, there are some that will follow up by email, and there, there are several that I'm seeing that are clearly legal questions, and we don't have, we don't have a legal expert on here. Uh, so. We're going to avoid those. I, I'm not a lawyer, and I don't play one on TV. So, uh. okay. Here's a question on how can I find out more about the Sidless service that automatically orders additional licenses. And you should be able to indicate that any request for additional information in the survey after the um, after the presentation. If you take that survey, we'd appreciate it. You can also indicate if you want more information about any products or services. So I think we we've got time. We're going to take one more. We're going to take one more question here, and there was a. Um, there is a follow-up about the Express MVRs asking if Express MVRs have all the same information. Um, yes, the Express MVR would be the same as, as the Batch MVR. That will include all the same information. All right, so we appreciate your time today. Uh, we appreciate all of those who participated in our benchmark survey. Uh, we hope to have that participation next year as well, and we thank you for attending today's presentation.